Hello, my name is Nagin Vanderdaklu. I am currently a fellow at UCI Medical Center in Emergency Ultrasound and will be giving the SAEM Ultrasound Lecture on Ultrasound Guided Procedures, specifically the lumbar punctures, paracentesis, and thoracentesis. Our objectives for this talk will be to go over indications for ultrasound guidance, review the technique for ultrasound guidance, and recognize some of the pitfalls. We'll start by going over a case. We have a 32-year-old female who is morbidly obese with headache and fever. A lumbar puncture is necessary to rule out meningitis, but palpating for landmarks is challenging. How can you overcome this in order to rule out meningitis? Ultrasound can be helpful in LPs for different reasons. In patients who have a larger body habitus, it can be difficult to palpate landmarks. Also, in those who have had prior back surgery, anatomy may be distorted, and ultrasound can assist in direct visualization of the intervertebral space. However, studies have shown that ultrasound guidance is useful among all patients. To start, you will first need to prepare your equipment. This means getting your ultrasound machine and your LP tray with the appropriate personal protective equipment. You can position your patient in either lateral decubitus or sitting upright. Whichever way you choose, you should not have your patient move after you have ultrasounded him or her. Be aware, if you are checking CSF opening pressure, that lateral decubitus is the best and most accurate position to do so in. By using ultrasound, we can identify the landmarks necessary for our LP. Prepare your linear transducer. If you have a larger patient, the C60 curvilinear probe may be used for deeper penetration. Now that your patient is positioned and you have the right probe, you should find Tufir's line, which is the horizontal line between the top of the posterior superior iliac crests. Here we can see how one can identify Tufir's line by palpating the posterior superior iliac crests and drawing an imaginary line across the back. This ensures that we are below the level of the spinal cord. Now you can place the ultrasound probe midline in the transverse plane over the spinous process along Tufir's line. Visualize the dome-like hyperechoic line of the spinous process with posterior shadowing in the middle of your screen. Once you see this, you can mark the skin above and below the middle of your probe. You may need to wipe off excess gel in order for the marker to mark the skin. Again, we see the dome-like hyperechoic line that is the spinous process with posterior shadowing. This marks the midline of the back. The two images are the same. However, on the right, we have it marked for easier identification. Next, place your probe in the midline sagittal plane along your vertical crosshairs. Visualize the inner spinous space between the spinous processes making sure this is the middle of your screen. Now you can again mark the skin on each side of the middle of the probe as shown. Here we can see the inner spinous space between the two hyperechoic spinous processes. The indicator is pointed cephalad as indicated by the blue dot in the upper left hand of the screen. Here we have the same image, marked for easier identification of landmarks. Again, the inner spinous space is seen between the spinous processes as marked. Once you have your patient marked, do not have them move. You can sterilely prep and drape the patient for their LP at the intersection of their crosshairs. The pitfalls of using ultrasound for LPs are that they may still have difficulty if the patient is very large or morbidly obese. If your probe is not perpendicular to the skin or it's not stable when marking the skin, your crosshairs may be off. The same will happen if your patient moves after marking their skin. So be sure to keep your patient from moving and keep your probe as stable as possible.
Our second case involves a 57-year-old male with a history of liver cirrhosis who presents with fever and a distended abdomen. The concern here is that the patient has spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. He will need a diagnostic paracentesis to determine whether or not this is the case. Why use ultrasound guidance for paracentesis? Because it increases success of the procedure. It can assist in locating small pockets of fluid as little as 100 cc's and reduces complications. By using ultrasound, you can avoid bowel or bladder injuries and avoid vascular structures such as the inferior epigastric vessels. For this procedure, we will need a low-frequency transducer such as the C60 curvilinear probe. You can also use your linear transducer. For ultrasound guidance, you will need to place the probe in a sterile probe cover. If you plan on using ultrasound for assistance, then you can just mark your pocket of fluid in two planes, as long as the patient does not move after marking. By placing the patient with the head of the bed slightly elevated, gravity will act on the acidic fluid and it will pool in the inferior abdomen. You can use either the infra-umbilical or lateral approach. I prefer the lateral approach as fluid pools on the sides of the abdomen, creating a nice pocket of acidic fluid to tap. If you have difficulty visualizing fluid, you can place a pillow under the patient's right side, placing them in a left lateral decubitus position. This will allow fluid to accumulate on the left side of the abdomen. Probe placement is shown in this image in either the inferior umbilical approach or lateral approach. Here we see a large pocket of acidic fluid extending about 10 centimeters deep. You can see the loops of bowel floating in the acidic fluid below. After locating a large pocket, switch to the high frequency linear probe. Watch your needle tip as it advances to avoid damaging other structures such as bowel, bladder, or the inferior epigastric arteries. Here is another clip of an ultrasound guided paracentesis. One must take care not to apply too much pressure trying to get through the peritoneum so as not to injure underlying bowel. As listed, some of the pitfalls are not choosing the largest pocket of fluid, and needle visualization may be difficult. It is important not to mistake the bladder or other possible cystic structures as a pocket of fluid. As with any paracentesis, there is still a risk of bowel or bladder injuries and hemorrhage or hematoma formation. Our third case involves a 60-year-old female with a history of ovarian cancer. She presents with shortness of breath for two weeks. She appears to be in mild respiratory distress. Given the scenario involving a woman with malignancy, especially ovarian cancer, this should raise your suspicion for a pleural effusion, otherwise known as Meg syndrome. Because of her abnormal vital signs and distress, she will likely benefit from a thoracentesis. The benefit of using ultrasound for this procedure is similar to that of paracentesis mm -hmm. in that it has been shown to increase success of the mm -hmm. procedure and decrease complications. You can directly visualize the pocket of fluid to aspirate as well. It should be noted that in cases of empyema, a pigtail catheter may be more beneficial, which is typically placed by IR. In this video, we see a view of Morrison's pouch, and we see the diaphragm move with respiratory variation. However, 
we do not see the mirror image artifact on the other side of the diaphragm that is normally seen. This means there is some kind of fluid there, either an effusion or blood in most cases. In this image, there is a loculated fluid collection noted on transthoracic ultrasound. Here, thoracentesis may not be as beneficial as perhaps a VATS procedure to break up the loculations, and perhaps a pleuridesis to prevent reaccumulation of the effusion or empyema. When you are ready to do your procedure, you must first position the patient. This is done by having the patient sit up and lean forward, usually over a mayo stand, with their head on a pillow and arms out in front of them. You can either use a phased array probe for ultrasound assistance for localization of the fluid pocket, since this probe is great from getting between the rib spaces, or you can just use the linear probe for better visual visualization of your needle tip for ultrasound guidance. Once positioned, scan from below inferior scapula to lumbar spine and from posterior axillary line to near midline back. Your indicator should be pointed to both your and the patient's left as the indicator dot on the ultrasound screen should also be on the left. You want to scan until you visualize the largest pocket of fluid to tap. You must keep in mind the respiratory cycle of the patient and map accordingly. Here is a real-time ultrasound showing the needle tip in the pleural fluid. Now if your patient is unable to sit up, you can do the procedure in lateral decubitus as well, with the head of the bed slightly elevated so fluid can pool inferiorly. This approach will be similar to a chest tube placement, except you will use the thoracentesis kit. The pitfalls of this procedure are that you may have issues with your morbidly obese patients. Similar to paracentesis, you may not find the largest pocket of fluid. It is important to locate the diaphragm and identify the respiratory cycle which may be difficult, but this can prevent poor needle placement and complications. In summary, I believe it is clear that ultrasound is incredibly helpful in reducing complications and an increased success rate of procedures due to the ability to directly visualize fluid pockets and other landmarks, especially in patients with difficult anatomy. Moreover, due to these benefits, it may reduce time spent on these potentially difficult procedures. I hope this was beneficial and informative to you all. I would like to thank SAEM for giving me the opportunity to do this lecture. My director, Dr. Fox, and Drs. Chen, Kinney, and Evanson for their assistance.